ladies and gentlemen, um, it's time for our Vision for Europe 2030 panel. It's a, it's a special panel for us because at the end of the day, what we try to do is to set up the trends and to build opportunities for Europe. I'm very honored and uh, grateful to have these amazing panelists now coming out with me. And um, I start with um, Mr. Uh, with, the, with the lady, Natalia Oporeza, who is um, Chief Cybersecurity Officer of uh, Siemens. Mr. Dick Hawk, who already saw on the stage the Chief Executive Officer of Airbus Defense. Uh, Mr. Thomas Anholder, who is the A1 uh, CEO. And Mr. Eric Rasmussen, who is the CEO of uh, IHS. So please welcome them on the stage. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh, I guess there are too many interesting things going on out there, but those that are here want to hear about the future of Europe. And uh, I wish we have the opportunity to further what, I what we will doing now. We, have, we work with our uh, innovation and knowledge partner, IE Business School, who are taking very careful notes from our discussions. And they will be sent to over 2,000 media and to all the European Commission just before the elections. And this is uh, hopefully going to be a good guideline for where the business wants Europe to go and how we see it. So I have a number of very important questions and I would like to start with, um, with the lady, of course. <laughs> um, what consequences has the growing interconnection of devices? How do you see uh, the future, both challenges and opportunities? Well, you know, this digital world is a world of software, first of all. It is also a word that uh, it's e increasing the interconnection. So by year 2020, uh, 20 billion of uh, devices, IT devices will be connected. And it, it really doesn't matter how many, but the fact is that they are going to be connected. And the fact that we have a word including software means as well that we have a word including vulnerabilities. And unfortunately, there are several actors, call it hackers, if you will, that they have different motivations to uh, do something with those vulnerabilities and use them either to win information or to do something else. And, and, then, and then, of course, this can create difficulties to society to use the advantage of this digitalized, digitalized world. And therefore, what we need to do as society is to create an increased trust in the utilization and the usage of these uh, digital solutions. And the way we are uh, uh, increasing trust is by protecting the information, by protecting the digital products that we have in our society so that they can be used by uh, everyone in a safe manner by protect protecting the different information that is included in this digital world. So this is, this is kind of the, the uh, uh, challenges that we have, uh, including both uh, risk and op opportunities because we have a, a lot of opportunities to grow into the different cybersecurity solutions that we are providing to the digital world. So um, this, is, this is what I can tell you from, from uh, me. Let me. Let me connect here in to go back to the general topic, uh, Mr. Arnolder. Um, compared to US and China, where do you see the competitive advantages of Europe? <laughs> well, uh, good morning, first of all. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, um, uh, the, the name of the Sputnik moment or know what the Sputnik moment mm. is. You know, in 1957, when the Russians launched the first artificial satellite, the Americans were shocked because they had completely missed what is going on. And that led to what we call the space race, the race to the moon. And, uh, Eventually, in 1969, the Americans succeeded with the first human landing on the moon. And I feel, in a sense, uh, what is happening today in Europe, hopefully, is the Sputnik moment uh, for Europe. Your event is part of creating that Sputnik atmosphere, because what we see at the moment is that um, Europe is lagging behind uh, from uh, in, in many dimensions, I believe. If you look at... Uh, the lack of growth in comparison to what is happening uh, both in the West as well as in the East. 
We talked about artificial intelligence, where um, we heard today that many things are happening by the commission, uh, but if you compare it to China, we are completely lagging behind. We are lagging behind in autonomous driving, in e-mobility. Um, we have to catch up in 5G in many, di many dimensions. And uh, that needs to serve for us as a wake-up call in Europe. I think we have very strong assets. We will be talk about, talking about that later, I guess. Mm. Very strong assets. But we need to understand that the European model is not built on military supremacy or a 1.3 billion domestic market with very cheap labor. It's built on innovation and economic competitiveness. And it seems <coughs> to me that we tend to forget this legacy which we have. We have become too self-comfortable um, and we really need to catch up in order you know, to seize that um, moment of the Sputnik moment uh, in order to catch up that competitiveness uh, edge in 2030. Well, I would like to ask the same question to uh, Mr. Hawking. So, uh, you are executive director of uh, one of the Europe's prides, it's Airbus, and uh, particularly of the space and uh, defense. Um, where do you see our competitive edge? Where do you see Europeans? Um, and we're, let's not oppose continents. Let's build up on our values, on what we have, and how we can use it to improve people's life here. Hmm. I think we have everything it takes. We have proven that over the time. You see, Airbus is a good example of what Europe can achieve if they stick together. Because uh, the problem is today, if we would try to build an Airbus today, I'm not sure it would work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we had the uh, we were very lucky that at the right point of time, the right people came together under the pressure to decide: Do we want a monopolist running the air traffic of the world, or do we want to have competition and having a second company building up in order to compete? Because at the end, everyone takes advantage of it because. Competition creates innovation, and it has been since then that uh, aerospace has developed very nicely because of the the head-to-head -head race of two very important companies. Hope, and I'm sure there will be a third one in the future. But but there is the need for competition. It, it creates innovation. The disadvantage we have in Europe is today is we go back to fragmentism and we go back to nationalism. So I think what what is important is that we keep the European idea that we. We use the innovation capa capacity that, it, that we have and the diversity, which is, I think, the root of our innovation in order to build more companies like Airbus and to keep also our innovation in, in line for space for other topics as well. So. We're talking, I mean, everything that we talk makes one sense only, improving people's lives. Everything, I mean, technology, <coughs> whatever. Why would we do it if not for this? Uh, and in order to have different points of view outside of, uh, of Europe, um, I will be hopeful to, to hear from uh, Mr. Rasmussen um, your thoughts. Because if, if we say uh, it, democracy is not perfect, but there has not been invented anything better yet, um, from your point of view as a, as a professional in, in the, um, let's say, challenging areas of uh, uh, defending that, would you, would you say that you see any challenges in, in sh changing the way the future of democracy looks like, democratic elections, and how it looks? It's a good question, and I'm very sensitive to the fact that I'm the only American up here on a Europe Vision 2030 <laughs> panel. Um, so I want to be careful about how I express what I think is important for you, but I do recognize that the the forces that are pressuring Europe are looking to divide. And education um, has been weakened, at least in my country, in ways that make it more difficult to understand where we came from as a democratic experiment and what the impact of the war was on the building of post-war institutions what the result of those institutions has been in prolonged peace and increasing integration and the increasing simplicity 
of moving goods from place to place, raising everybody just a little bit from where they were before, and giving them aspirations to what might come next. Mm. You have your European model under challenge. And I think that when I think of 2030 for Europe, I wish for you coherence and prosperity and a degree of success that capitalizes on what you've already done, but also recognizes you are in the midst of a lot of opposition and you need to ensure that your citizens are well educated in critical thinking and in those processes that are designed to manipulate and to separate, to divide, to irritate, and help your citizens learn how best to oppose those forces and hold on to the good things you have. Well, saying that, I, I cannot stop by asking you the question, aren't you concerned about the growing populism in America now? The, um, there are challenges everywhere, shall we say. <laughs> um, the, um, it is clear that there is a rising separation. There are inward-looking political efforts that are aiming to break down the bridges that we have built. Um, they are taking multiple forms. Um, some aspects of my own federal government are a part of that damaging process and it is reverberating elsewhere and we just saw today a headline in the New York Times saying that the midterm elections in the Philippines have been a resounding reinforcement of Duterte. That's um, more fodder for the concern that we have on the rise of populism, the rise of nationalism, and the methods that are being used to separate us, to turn us against one another, and I think it needs to be actively opposed. Well, um, I think that here Ms. Oporeza can give a, a point of view as the Chief uh, Security Officer of Siemens of such a, uh, it's one of the, the prides of, of Europe also. How do you believe in these new changing times the trust would be sustained? Because without trust, there is no society, and there are no opportunities in general. If you don't trust people, if you don't trust the, the, uh, the, the basic infrastructure you're using. So what is your opinion on that? Yeah, trust is a new goal. And, uh, and the, the best way to do it is by cooperating. So we have to cooperate a lot uh, to establish trust and, and to be fast uh, in, 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 in providing the right cybersecurity solution. So as you know, the, the, the let's say the bad guys or hackers, and you can call them somewhere else, but at the end of the day, uh, they are acting very fast and they are developing them, the, the, themselves very fast. Mm -hmm. They don't have to uh, look for regulations, they don't have internal processes to follow, so they, they, and, and they use the, the, the technologies that we have available, so they act very fast. And we, as a society, we need to be fast as well. So one of the things that we have done in, in the last uh, several months, uh, actually in the last year, was to partner with different companies, very important companies, companies like IBM, companies like Airbus, and we founded the so-called Charter of Trust. And, and what the Charter of, cross, uh, of Trust is including is a set of ten, 10 principles on how do we want to address cybersecurity responsible, uh, on, on, a respons on a responsible way for, uh, for the society. And, and the principles are including <coughs> things like taking ownership of the topic and uh, giving to the topic, to the cybersecurity topic, the right priority, the, type, the, the right importance that, that we need to do, giving transparency on the number of attacks that we have. We all have attacks, probably, uh, if you say you don't have, not you as a person, but you, as an example, yes. if you tell me do you don't have any cybersecurity attacks, I would think that uh, you rather don't know that you have them. And everyone has it, everyone has to deal with that, everyone has to uh, make the best out of that and, and, and uh, install the proper measures to do that. So we are very proud, we have a year already, we are very proud of being together doing this and because we don't have time to reinvent the wheel. 
and uh, we are cooperating together with the partners. Uh, IBM, I mentioned, um, uh, Airbus, I mentioned, uh, but as well Cisco, and as well others, and we already agree on different solutions to be developed once and used by every other partner so that we can act very fast in the provision of cybersecurity in, in, in this digital world. It is a global charter, it's not only Europe, uh, so we are including every, every company in every uh, part of the world to cooperate with us. I'll go back to the global vision. If we open the news, you only see news majorly for Google, Facebook, you have um, Alibaba, and many others. So um, my question is for, for you, uh, Mr. Arnold. Uh, do, you, do you think, what, are the, what is the competitiveness of Europe compared to these giants? Because even now Bulgaria is, I was proud to be appointed as digital ambassador for, for the country to talk to big companies. Because some companies became more powerful than, than countries. They had more impact than countries. Mm -hmm. What about Europe? Do we have these, um, and are we looking at more to, to rise, and how we keep them in Europe, but not losing them? What is our competitiveness? Well, let me start, start first with uh, saying what our competitive advantage definitely is not, is regulation. Right. And what we tend to believe is that we can fight those giants with regulation. But this, that does never work, and it is just putting European companies at a disadvantage. Mm. And we see that uh, in Europe, we're just too slow and too focused with regulation. Just let me take the example of the new copyright initiative, which in principle I support. But the discussion has started in 2010. I discussed this uh, the other week with Commissioner Oettinger at the lunch. He described it to me. It started in 2010. Um, he kicked off the process in 2016. Now we have approved it and we have two more years in order to put uh, the uh, European regulation into national law. Mm. Between 2010 and 2019, Facebook increased its subscriber base from 500 million to 2.5 billion customers, or users which they have. So that's not the means, but we do have assets. We have very strong international companies still even though we would not, would not have it today, well, we if you think about competition, here, most com of them, think about competition law today, mm -hmm. Siemens, Alstom, we would not have uh, 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 do Air, uh, Airbus today. But we have uh, biggest airspace companies. We have the biggest chemistry company. We have still, even though under trouble, the biggest automotive sector. We have excellent telco companies, uh, I have to say, obviously. Also on the telco vendor side, the discussion about Huawei, it's about a discussion between two Chinese and two European vendors. We have still a very strong educational system. We have, by and large, stable democracies, and that's an asset. Um, we have high quality of living, which in principle is a means of attracting talent. But there are so many more things to do, like uh, the harmonization, like the focus on growth, on innovation, like deregulation, mm. like creating level playing yeah. field on a global scale, not on a local scale. We are just thinking about level playing fields on, on, on national level or on European level, but we need to think globally. If you found a startup in China working with AI, your laboratory is 1.3 billion citizens. Right. Here it's seven, with the restrictions of GDPR. In Austria, my home company, it's eight with the restriction of GDPR. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of GDPR because for us as a large corporation, trust plays an important role. But for small companies, we need sandboxes in order to be able to scale up. And uh, um, I, I think this is really where we have to work on uh, in Europe. Mm. Well, Mr. Hockey, that's, uh, I've already mentioned you're doing great stuff internally, building acceleration programs, um, creating opportunities, I would like to ask you the same question, the competitiveness, mm -hmm. through your point of view, through, through your shoes. I think we, we, today we are still competitive, but it's, it's getting more and more complicated. We have to attract talent in the, in the war for talent. Uh, that's, of course, all the gaffers look for, for the same um, 
competence profiles like us, and of mm. course, um, we still have like elements like space where people are really attracted to. So it's aerospace is a still a big attraction for young people. So this is helping us, but mm. it, it gets more and more difficult. And exactly as said, uh, our competitiveness by the fragmentation of the national thinking in Europe is creating a lot of problems because we have to optimize for each of the countries. Mm. A company like us, we have four home countries. Now adding Canada, we say we have five home countries. But of course, it's, it is also very complex in the, in the steering of a company, in the balance of the company. But I still believe we have all the talent it takes, but fully agree, if we don't get our act together in Europe and start thinking European, being able to address a 500 million people market, we will lose on many of the topics. And the next topic we will lose is space. Because right now, the Americans and the Chinese are accelerating their ambition in space. And we in Europe discuss what we would like to do next. And we will be sub-sub-supplier probably to the Americans and Chinese in the future if we don't decide what our ambition and vision for Europe on space is, for example. Well, um, I have uh, some few numbers for you, and I'll be happy to hear your comments. 13 years ago, Europe was responsible for approximately 32% of the global GDP production. 13 years later, Europe is responsible for around 20, 21. Mm. It's like almost one third of the role of Europe being uh, vanished. I mean, in the, in, in the global GDP production. And of course, we know where the replacement comes from, who is adding the value and who is decreasing the value. I would leave it up to you to answer this question, um, and whoever wants to start first. Do you think we can change the trends, or shall we see the trend deepening and, and getting even worse for Europe? So what do you think? I think we should, I we should change the trend. It's not that we, we could, but we should change the trend, of course. And I think Europe has a lot of success in, in the past and has been proven to be a, a strong union uh, in the provision of the different products and solutions, included technology as well. So I think we have all, all of us need to look into that situation and I think we should uh, grow more and, and do more for, for, the, for the global economy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a good I will, but... I believe that the current changes through digital transformation give us, uh, in the future, a competitive edge to bring mm -hmm. a lot of the capacity back to Europe. Because remember 20, 30 years ago, we were looking for low-cost countries for production. Today, with additive manufacturing, this competitive advantage is not a regional topic anymore. So there are a lot of topics which going through the... Through the uh, uh, digital twin going into uh, um, digital PLM tools uh, simulation, uh, we can make manufacturing competitive in Europe again. Um, and on top, uh, having the domain how of many of the key industries worldwide in Europe, we have a fundamental differentiating factor. Mm. And IT, as much as it is important, it is also in many areas already commodity because. Uh, to be honest, which cloud you store your data in is not a competitive advantage because you have at least three to choose from, maybe four or five, if you take the smaller ones in. Um, of course, it would be great to have a European platform, but it's not the, the most important thing. But we should, and I think you're a good example of that, you can create a network and a base for innovation in Europe. We could scale it to 500 million people and we could ensure that startup founders staying here because they get hopefully more access to capital and they can scale the pro the, their model here in Europe instead of going to the US in order to address a bigger market. So if we get our regulation and European um, approach together, we have everything it takes. And I think especially if we protect our domain know-how, we will be also leading edge in the decades to come. It is certainly possible for you in your reunification of your effort to focus on space or something like that. I would argue that you should look at climate. Um, I work at a fair number of corners of the world where climate change is already evident. It is going to become more evident over a relatively short period of time, and there is an opportunity 
for European firms to take the lead on the mitigation strategies and the mitigation technologies right. and the opportunities to leapfrog from those things that are doing the damage to those things that are helping repair. And I don't think that opportunity is yet being taken fully inside Europe. Um, it's also not being taken fully in my, inside my country, but it is being addressed pretty effectively in Asia. Um, and there are some transformations in India, not much yet that I know about in Africa. There is a wide open opportunity to make a ton of money doing good on climate mitigation strategies and technologies. So what is your, your thought on the numbers and the opportunities? Um, I, I, by principle, I'm an optimist, and I think there is plenty of opportunities, actually, and there's plenty of assets. And the um, cultural, but as well as economic diversity, which we have in Europe, is an asset which we have to seize much more. We have very strong businesses in environmental affairs. We have very strong businesses, I mentioned a few before, in manufacturing. Um, now, with those new technologies coming up, like 5G, where we're investing a lot and where we have been um, preparing ourselves a lot already since uh, quite a few years, actually, I have to say, um, 5G will uh, act as a platform of combining many of those assets, devices, industries, and we have, have to seize um, the potential of doing partnerships with manufacturing, with any environmental companies, with that big ecosystem which we still have in Europe um, in order to come up with new cases, seizing in our case uh, 5G, but also seizing all the new technological uh, uh, developments which we see coming up. However, we need to have the regulatory, or I should rather say non-regulatory framework in order to scale up that innovation. And this is where part of my concern is. Well, because of course you're a, a very regulated business yeah. and uh, as, a, as a telco. So I would like to, s to hear about at the end of the day, mm. you are um, uh, uh, shaping the future. Mm. You're, you're providing the infrastructure and it's definitely mm. important that we see the, uh, you know, the, the growth in the sector mm. rather than the opposite, which we see now because what will happen next. Mm. So what do you think are the biggest challenges for the policymakers in the next one to two decades? from your point of view? Well, number one is understanding the complexity of the world we're living in and the impact of technology um, in that world. Number two is being able to think uh, globally and not only locally, being able to either um, deregulate or export regulation. GDPR could be an example of positive export of regulation if we manage to create mm. a global level playing field. If we don't manage to do so, we have to rethink GDPR, but it can't be uh, uh, an uneven playing field. Number three is uh, the speed of the decision-making process. I gave you um, an example before. And the last one I really would like to point out is modernizing our education system. I think we have a very strong foundation I think uh, I was very fascinated uh, by, uh, by uh, the example of the mathematician you gave. My son is also six years old. Uh, I don't think uh, he has earned uh, any mathematics medal yet. But these young people, they are full of, spy of, of fire, full of empathy, full of positive energy, and let's not destroy them. Let's Let's give them the opportunity, you know, to embrace life, to learn, to do what uh, they feel passionate about, and not uh, let's not move them through an education system which, in some of the cases, uh, is using tools from 30, 40 years ago. It's very optimistic, even more, I believe. Mm -hmm. I told you I'm an optimist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you are an <laughs> optimist. <laughs> no, it's, it's not enough to complain. Eh? It, that's true for competitiveness. Yeah. That's true also for co populism, which was addressed before. Yeah? It's easy to complain about um, populism, but you have to propose an alternative model, an alternative solution. In our business, we, only, we also <laughs> cannot complain about our competition. We have to propose an alternative which for our customers is the better alternative. Yeah. And that's true in business, that's true with populism, that's true in, uh, in leading Europe. Um, and that's, I think, where we really need to be super focused about. And uh, one thing, 
every citizen of Europe can do is in two weeks go to the polls and uh, you know uh, give a signal to a strong Europe. That's a very easy thing to do. Um, we will see what uh, the uh, turnout uh, rate at the European election will be. I hope it will be beyond 50%. Um, but still, that's already quite optimistic. Oh, Dirk, uh, Mr. Hockey, so what, what, is the, what is your answer for this? Where, um, w if we have to outline what we expect from our policy makers, because I will, this will be my last question afterwards, um, Next commission is, is about to be select, elected now. You said? The next commission, the next yeah. college, is about to be elected now. We have yeah. European elections in two mm -hmm. weeks' time. You saw here the commissioner Gabriel, who is in, a, in, in a, uh, her own elections yeah. time, and uh, that's why she excused herself today, because she had to be in five different locations, because she wants the vote, yeah. of course, of the people, who, um, so she can continue work and do what she's doing. So we're in a very, very last moment of the elections. But as I told you in the beginning, we shall be sending the document from all these discussions through all these political leaders, throughout all our media partners. So what would be the three top things that you would expect the new commission to do in order to inspire the future of Europe 2030? And of course, to make it a better one for all of us. Yeah, I think... Uh, in Related to my business, there are a couple of things. Uh, of course, it should be uh, with the direction to strengthen competitiveness of Europe. And this is only possible if you take uh, the egoism of each of the countries um, down in order to look at a broader framework of how Europe could compete in a global arena uh, by using the capacity and, uh, and the strengths of each of the countries, but without always asking what is in for me but rather looking at the broader picture of Europe. For defense, I hope we will start looking also at a European defense policy, um, because today we talk about for a long time, we have created the European Defense Fund, we work on a couple of initiatives, but it's still very bureaucratic, very slow, and uh, it will be a proof point very soon, because we talk about some very big European defense project like the Future Combat Air System. If we cannot, if we are not able to realize this project on a European basis, bringing all the countries together and the key European industry players to realize that project, it would be a very bad sign for Europe and our competitiveness. Because today, the pragmatism of the different systems that we use, they're going against the efficiency, they're going against innovation. And this is, of course, something if you want to, to also defend our wealth in the future, we have to make sure that we use our resources in an efficient way. And this is only possible if you look at the European defense policy that we create uh, European um, defense procurement together, yeah. where we really uh, look at synergies and uh, developing systems together. Ms. Soporeza, what, is yeah, your, what, is, what are the three things that you want to see Europe? You know, doing? I will focus on only one, and this is that uh, to have regulations, if not global, at least within a European perspective. So we have... Uh, Treaties in, in Germany, we have something else in, in France and alike. So in total, we have 70 regulations impacting our infrastructure and, and, and products, and that makes us very, very slow. That doesn't make us more secure, right? And, 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 and uh, this, is, this is one of the biggest situations that we have to, to Security, fix. defense. What, is, what will be the, your point of view? Well, I, I think I already gave... Uh, uh, four, four ideas. Um, uh, what, what I really want to say for the telco industry as, uh, as, as the last thing is investors are asking ourselves a lot um, why, uh, why should I put my, my, my money today in telco industry? You're so regulated yeah, versus the OTTs. We are super efficient. We are investing um, uh, uh, roughly half of the amount of the Americans uh, per capita because we're earning half of the revenue uh, than the Americans per capita. Still, we are providing network quality which is equal or better, meaning we are super efficient in what we do. 
However, we could do much more. We're doing this as a group. We're moving into entertainment. We're moving into gaming. We're moving into cloud. We're moving into the Internet of Things. We're moving into cybersecurity. We're doing so in Bulgaria um, very successfully. But we would like to do more as an industry. And I think overall European businesses would like to do more because we have the attitude, we have the muscle, we have the legacy, we have the assets. But we need to get the opportunity by policymakers. Thank you very much. And um, I hear that we have to finish, but the last uh, words from you, American, um, through the point of view of, of Europe 2030, the three things you think Europe should do better through the policy, I mean, regulation and innovation through legislation. I'm going to give you only one because I'm not competent to answer most of your policy, law, and legislation questions, but I would advocate for you the very best you can do on absorbing new teaching methodologies so that by 2030 you have a generation of students yeah. who have become critical thinkers, who have become innovative thinkers, creative thinkers, confident thinkers, who can take their place on the world stage, yeah. bringing Europe the kind of recognition you would like it to have. Thank you so much for this panel. It was a real honor having you all with us. Thank you.